Uh, but somewhere you said no, you have to close that. Yeah, here it is off now. Here in go live it is off now. Okay, no. Uh, now you check. Yes. Okay. No, mute it. Now you check. Send the zoom link. Hmm? Send the zoom and the zoom link. Hmm? That day I send. Uh, okay. Now you go to this home page. Go to IAC home page. IAC home page. Where is Srinivas?
If you want to write in that, you can use the paper. Yeah. Hello, how are we to hear? Hi. Hi, good morning. You hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Raghuvir, you can hear me clearly? Yeah. Okay. Can you um, just tell me what will happen at the opening of the meeting? Um, yeah, the program is like this. I will give us short welcome and then uh, the director will come on and uh, make his remarks and introduce you. Mm -hmm. Then you will deliver your talk. And following that, there will be a QA. and a yep. And then the vote of thanks. Okay, great. Hey, Arshana, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> nice to see you. How are yeah. things in Rupi? Hello? Hello? Good. Yeah, good we're just getting ready. I hope to see you here physically. In oh, okay, fine. Okay, I can see myself on the small screen. Now there is a lady who is, I don't know. Right. Okay. Okay. Hi, all. Very nice to see you. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. I'm Pradeep. Good to see you, Pradeep. Yeah. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thank you so much. Are you, are you in uh, Saskatoon or back to London? Well, I've left Canada. I um, split my time between the United States and the UK. And... Um, I'm just back a few days ago into the into the UK. Okay. So yeah. um, they let me in. It was fraught. I yeah, had to uh, have um, negative test certificates and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, <laughs> here I am. I'm in quarantine at the moment for ten days. Okay. Yeah, very yeah. much looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Yeah. How are things with the virus with you? Uh, yeah, it's not bad. In fact, we are recovering quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, and Bangalore is not bad at all. Uh, so I think India as a, as a whole, uh, we are on the recovery path now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, uh, vaccination has started big time. Yeah. I'm having my my vaccination on Monday. <laughs> oh, I see. That's great. That's a big a big moment in my life. <laughs> yeah, I know.
गुड इवनिंग सर डॉक्टर रघुवीर आर वी रेडी टू स्टार्ट आई थिंक वी स्टिल हैव अ फ्यू मिनट्स इट्स थ्री सिक्स यस सर वी आर रेडी वी विल वेट फॉर अनदर थ्री फोर मिनट्स so uh, professor rangraj and professor howard waiter is online so yeah hello professor waiter hello very Ajay. pleased to meet you so nice of you to uh, uh, you know give us this lecture thank you well i appreciate the honor of the invitation <laughs> and um it's nice to um keep these links going with um bangalore So um, I'm very happy to be with you, uh, despite the fact that um, uh, we're all missing the cricket. <laughs> <laughs> I think England are doing a, a, quite well, actually. Two <laughs> hundred for two at the moment. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it's happening right here. <laughs> <laughs> so Howard Professor Rangrajan is our director, director yes, of the institute. Yeah. So you, right now you are in Imperial College or in Canada? Uh, uh, I'm um, in the UK, and um, I'm I have a cottage in the countryside near the East Coast. Uh, mm. It's about two hours from London. Okay. Yeah, but uh, I I flew in from the States a couple of days ago, so I'm formally in quarantine. Oh. I get arrested if I go outside. Okay. <laughs> I think you escaped. I had to travel. I had to travel with um, back with uh, negative test certificates, and uh, it was very fraught. But anyway, they let me in, and here I am. <laughs> yeah, I think you escaped the polar vortex. I think that is slamming. Well, the... yes, actually, we we we're expecting um, we're expecting snow this weekend. Yeah. <clears throat> well, what's the temperature with you? Oh, here it's quite nice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So where is Chennai? Chennai is uh, to the east of us. Um, mm -hmm. So it's about yeah about three sixty kilometers uh, to the east of us on the sea yeah. coast. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> okay. I guess we can start. Mm -hmm. Okay, sir. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Department of Civil Engineering at IISC, it gives me great pleasure in welcoming you all to the ninth biennial lecture in memory of Professor Govind Rao. Uh, a special welcome to the distinguished speaker, Professor Howard Weeter, who is joining us from UK. I also welcome Professor Rangarajan, who has kindly consented to preside on this event. i welcome the family of uh, professor govind rao shrimati jayshree and others who are present at this uh, thing event online i have a, a special uh, welcome and acknowledgement to professor a sridharan 
our former colleague who was kindly uh, instrumental in contributing to this event by uh, his generosity in establishing an endowment. Uh, a brief about uh, Professor Goindrao. Uh, he joined IISC <laughs> as the uh, professor and chair of the department in 1950 and continued in this uh -huh. position till 1967 <laughs> with distinct. There are meeting simultaneously, Patan. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, what is it? Mute. Please mute your uh, mics. Yeah. Uh, professor Goindrao joined IISC in 1950 as professor and head of the department and continued in this uh, role till 1967. And in the, in the course of that, he established uh, vibrant and rich academic programs in uh, water resources and hydraulics, structures and geotechnical engineering. And he himself was a distinguished professor in hydraulics research and served as uh, advice, principal advisor in a number of the uh, river valley projects. Uh, professor Goindrao's uh, interactions uh, with uh, people were such that people were left uh, inspired and encouraged to uh, pursue academic research. The Department of Civil Engineering is indebted to him for his yeoman services and remembers him on this important day. Uh, an alert to the audience, so we have a Q&A after his talk, after the speaker's talk, and my colleagues uh, will bring them up if you type your questions up on the chat section. I now invite Professor Rangarajan to make his presidential remarks and in introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any presidential remarks, uh, but I have great pleasure in introducing our uh, distinguished speaker today. Our speaker today is Professor uh, Howard Beter, uh, and he uh, is a Canada Excellence Research Chair Laureate in uh, Water Security at the University of Saskatchewan, where he founded the Global Institute for Water Security. And uh, he's uh, also the Distinguished Research Fellow and Emeritus Professor of Hydrology at Imperial College London. He's a leading expert in hydrological sciences and modeling. He has published more than 200 refereed articles and six books. He's a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, the Royal Academy of Engineering UK, and the American Geophysical Union. Awards uh, that he has uh, got include IAHS UNESCO WMO International Hydrology Prize, and the Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz International Prize for Water. He has initiated and led national and international research programs in UK and Canada, and has advised states and national governments on flood, water resource, and water quality issues. He represented Hungary, Chile, which is ongoing, and Argentina at the International Court of Justice, and recently sat on the International Court of Arbitration con concerning the Indus Water Treaty. He has until uh, 2014, he was, he was until 2014, vice chair of the World Climate Research Program's Global Energy and Water Cycle Exchange uh, project. And he also continues to advise UNESCO's GWADI arid zone uh, water program. So with this brief introduction, let me uh, now invite uh, Professor Beter to start his uh, talk on water security in a changing world, which is very timely uh, for us. Professor Beter. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, it really is uh, an honor and a pleasure to deliver the 2021 Govind Rao lecture and a pleasure to join you all in Bangalore and indeed around the world. Uh, I'm more surprised at the global reach of these virtual events. And I know we have other colleagues from India and maybe some people from the UK too. And I'm particularly honored because I realize that it's the opening day of the uh, India-England uh, test series. So there were competing interests there. Um, and I have to confess that England are getting off to a good start. <laughs> um, Professor Rao, Professor Govind Rao was a pioneer in research, in hydraulics research, um, but he also applied his skills in science and engineering to some of the national challenges of his day around water management. And my talk today will very much follow uh, that theme of his career. Um, my message is uh, a, a simple one. Um, 
The challenges of water management have never been so great or have had such societal importance. According to the UN, 4 billion people, that is more than half of the world's population, face moderate to severe threats to their water security. And these threats exist at local, regional and at global scales. So there's a big question for the scientific community as to how we respond to those challenges. And I'm going to argue that we need to follow Professor Govind Rao's example, not only to develop the science needed to understand our changing environment, but also to work with governments, water authorities and the public so they can understand and manage change. Let me try and get my, uh, here we go, screen up. Uh, okay. Is that working for you now? Yes. Uh, well, yes. well, we can see your notes, but uh, it's uh, the next slide also. Can you go to the presentation mode? Uh, uh, okay, maybe uh, we can see the next slide also. It's not full screen. Um, okay. No, I think that was, yeah. Oops, how are we doing? Yeah, well, it's it's okay, we can see it, but as I said, uh, we can see the next slide also. So uh, in some uh, sense, we can preview, ah, now it's fine. Yes, please, yes, yeah. Now it's okay. Okay. Well, uh, it, we can I see, think, okay, um, there's a uh, the presentation mode, yeah, it's, um, yeah, presentation mode may be better. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just trying to click and it doesn't want to go. Please click on the presentation mode. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Trying to. Uh, or you go to the slideshow and see the top and the menu and see or view or. Um, yeah, resume slideshow. Uh, okay. I think maybe um, please press escape. It's okay. We can all see it. Please press escape once. Please press escape once. Yeah. Escape key. Yeah. yeah. Now you go to slideshow. Sorry, it's it's locked on me. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, well, resume slideshow. It is here. Yeah. Resume slideshow. Menu on top, Professor Peter. Go to the menu on top. There is a slideshow there. Maybe from there you can try doing it. On the top, you see a slideshow menu item. Yeah, resume slideshow. Yeah, uh, resume yeah, slideshow. Sure. There is one pop up there. Please click that. Just able. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, okay, this no. fine. Please okay. go ahead. Let's yeah. start. Yeah, it's this yeah. fine. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll go. We'll live with. Let's just try this. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to talk a, a, a little bit about the global challenges to water security, and and then I'm going to take you on a, a personal journey with me. Um, I left Imperial College in 2010. Um, to take up an, a, a rather unique opportunity in Canada. And um, I'm, I'll talk to you about some of the challenges that uh, Canada faces. And the fact that although Canada is considered a water rich country, um, it actually has all the challenges that you face in India and other countries around the world. Um, I'll talk to you about what, what we've been able to achieve there through science integration and national scale investment. And I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to bear in mind that Canada is a region which is generally cold. Um, a lot of the hydrology is dominated by uh, snow and ice and frozen soils, uh, but it's experiencing rapid warming. Um, now, 
about half the world's population and much of India receives their water from cold regions. So Canada can offer some quite important insights to India and globally about the world's changing cold regions. And as I was leaving Imperial in 2010, I was setting up some links with Bangalore and I'm very pleased to say that in my absence, those have really prospered. And so I'll say a little bit about some of the joint work um, with uh, Imperial and Bangalore at the end of my talk. So for those of you who are not water specialists, it's important, I think, to remember that water has got many dimensions. Um, of course, we need water for drinking and we couldn't survive for more than a few days without it. Um, but the biggest use of water is for agriculture, something like 80 to 85 percent of the world's consumed water um, goes to agricultural production. Uh, we use water for energy hydropower. Um, we use water for industry and we also use water to get rid of our wastes, sometimes through pipes as shown here, but more generally as diffuse pollution, for example, agricultural fertilizers and, and manures finding their way into river systems. And then really an important bottom line is that water is very important for biodiversity and there are really very significant threats to biodiversity at the moment because of our pressures on the water environment. All around the world, there are threats of um, extreme events and these pop up in the news very regularly. Um, although then they fade, I think, quite quickly from our memory. But many of you will recall the, the, the Pakistan floods in 2010. Some of you will remember New York going underwater in 2012. Um, Australia had a decadal drought, and then that was followed by very large scale floods. California has had a major drought and uh, is still suffering from um, diminished resources, particularly uh, groundwater over extraction. And the Aral Sea on the bottom left there is um, a notable example of um, upstream withdrawals for irrigated agriculture reducing the inflows to, so the Aral Sea is now something like a tenth of its previous area. Those are all dramatic examples, but the threats of water extremes are, are around us um, pretty much on an everyday basis. It's also easy to forget that water quality is as important as water quantity. And um, uh, there are, there are many issues around the world. Um, sometimes described as the world's largest mass poisoning is arsenic in Bangladesh. So as many of you know, there was a rapid expansion of groundwater use without realizing that the groundwater had natural arsenic. And so people got sick and died. Um, more generally, uh, one of the biggest threats to water quality around the world is from nutrients and that's from human wastes and animal wastes and particularly agricultural production. And uh, I've got an example on this slide of Lake Winnipeg, which is um, uh, 25,000 square kilometers, which uh, turned green, you can see it from space, due to algal blooms. And one of the things which you might be surprised about um, is that Canada, like many parts of the world, has real problems with rural communities and indigenous communities in providing um, clean drinking water. So it's a massive global problem, and it's certainly a problem that is um, it, 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 that, it, that occurs in Canada. Um, it's common to think about water as a, a problem that's in our own neighborhood, but it's important to remember, I think, that water is really now a global um, issue. So some of you will remember that uh, in 2011 there were some floods in Thailand and that severely shut down the global production of, um, of chips and uh, estimates of losses were 46 billion dollars. Um, some recent analysis uh, has shown that water moves around the world as, as embedded water in food and other products. 
And this is a little diagram showing um, those flows of virtual water around the world. So water scarce areas, um, for example, such as Israel, survive because they effectively import water through the food and other products that cross their borders. And then global extreme events can have important consequences. So the Russian heat wave in 2010 had a major impact on the wheat crop globally and food prices went up and that was reported to be one of the triggers of some of the unrest that occurred in the, um, the Arab Spring. So the global water challenges, first of all, we are using water unsustainably in many parts of the world. Um, that means that groundwater levels are declining and that's certainly a big issue in India. Rivers are drying up. We're seeing increasing competition for water resources and sometimes that happens at the local level um, and sometimes it happens at an international level. And so uh, water treaties like the Indus Water Treaty um, become very important in trying to manage those disputes. I've talked a little bit about the fact that water quality is degrading. Um, that's partly due to pollution and partly due to over abstraction. Uh, and there's massive loss of habitats and biodiversity for uh, aquatic ecosystems. And what we see around the world is increasing flood and drought risk. So if we look into the future, things don't get better. We've got population growth continuing, economic development continuing. We have to increase our agricultural production to maintain the world's population. This all puts pressures on our land and our water systems. So we're seeing changing land and water management. And we're also seeing climate change. And climate change itself feeds back to changing land and water management. We're seeing increased flood risk. We're seeing increased pressures on water resources. So that means that we're looking at 6 billion in water scarce areas, perhaps by the middle of the century. So if you're working as a water scientist, what do you do? I think we need to recognize that these are very large problems for science and society. First of all, we're working with complicated systems. So we used to think about the water as a natural environment, but it is no longer that, it's a managed environment and many of our major river flows are determined by decisions that society makes upstream. We're also seeing unprecedented change. So uh, we're seeing changes to land use, deforestation, increased intensification of agriculture, and a changing climate. And we're also needing to understand these changes at, at, at large scales, because we're seeing that at large scales, there can be important feedbacks from what we're doing to our land and water systems to the climate itself. So I'm gonna argue that we need to think about water science as, as something that has a big science need. Um, we, we have to be ambitious to deliver the science that we need to sustain development and global ecosystems. We have to understand the interactions and feedbacks between the climate and the land and water and society. Um, and that's a, a, a challenge for us. We tend to think, we tend to work in small groups on small problems. Here we have large problems. We need to integrate our resources and produce new solutions and communicate better with decision makers so they can be implemented. So four issues specifically. First of all, we live in an era where the humans are affecting the land and the climate um, in ways that are pervasive, but still not well understood. Um, we have to understand better the change that we see around us and the change that we can expect in the future. We have to recognize that the systems we're working with are human water systems. So they don't just involve the natural environment, they involve very much 
societal controls on the natural environment, and we need to think in a new way about that. I tried to show at the beginning that uh, water is multifaceted, and that means that we need to look to multiple disciplines. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but certainly we, we, we have traditionally thought about um, water as um, an engineering and earth science problem, but to understand water, we need to think about agriculture, we need to think about biology and ecosystems, and we also need to think about the social systems um, that control the environment. And so the social processes are important because we need to understand people's perspectives and attitudes that determine water management, but we also need to communicate better with the societies that we're dealing with so that they can understand the problem and we can help them to manage the way forward. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to turn now to Canada and I think I'm just gonna have a, an attempt to get back into screen mode. So just bear with me a moment. Okay, can you see that? Not yet. Well, I'm in slideshow mode. Let's go down. But your screen uh, is not shared. Maybe you should. Okay. Ah, okay. Yeah. Now, have I got into, I've, I think I've still got the same problem. Mm. Okay, well, we'll just carry on. Okay. <clears throat> okay, um, in 2010, I was approached by the University of Saskatchewan with um, really a unique offer. Um, they offered me $30 million for um, uh, a seven-year program of research in Canada, um, which was really a unique opportunity. It was part of a national program in Canada to um, bring um, new researchers into the country. So um, I went with interest and I founded the Global Institute for Water Security in 2011. And um, what we had there was really a foundation of a, a lot of excellence across many disciplines. So I was able to pull together about 65 faculty across 21 different academic units. And um, we used that as a basis to bring together some of this transdisciplinary integration that's needed to address some of the local problems. And I'll just spend a little bit of time um, talking to you about some of the issues in Canada. So first of all, this little diagram on the map on the right shows where the Saskatchewan River Basin is um, within Western Canada. And I'll just mention the scale here because this is the province of Saskatchewan. Um, and that's roughly twice the area of Germany and it has a population of about 1 million people. So Canada is a big country um, and it's sparsely populated. And 
This basin is about 400,000 square kilometers and 80 to 90% of the runoff is generated in the Canadian Rocky Mountains through snow and ice melt. And that water then travels through the, through the Canadian prairies, which are the home to about 80% of Canada's agriculture. And then there's a rather interesting and special area here. There's an inland wetland, which is the home to Aboriginal people. First Nations, um, about three to 6,000 of them. And their traditional livelihoods have been hunting and trapping and, and fishing. So the basin is interesting because um, it has all the challenges that we see around the world. The, um, the South Saskatchewan River, which rises in the Rocky Mountains of Southern Alberta, that the water resources are fully allocated um, already because mainly of, of um, uh, irrigation abstraction. We're seeing a world that's changing fast because the climate is warming and that's having severe impacts. There are major challenges of pollution and water quality, particularly nutrients. And like many parts of the world, the basin is complicated in terms of governance. So there are a very tiny part of the basin is in the United States. The majority is in Canada, but there are three different provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, and they each have their own water governance and their own water laws and their own um, legal systems. And then finally, this basin has a challenge of extreme events. It's always suffered from major drought sequences um, and um, it's also suffered from recent flooding and those effects have caused a lot of damage and they're expected to increase. When the prairies were first explored by um, Europeans in the 1850s, it was a dry period and they decided it was much too dry to develop agriculture, but um, that didn't last. It was followed by a wet period and the development began. Um, there's been history of droughts, uh, 1930s are notable, but also uh, more recently, 1999 to 2004 was at the time described as Canada's most costly natural disaster. It cost about a $6 billion hit to GDP. Floods have also been occurring, and um, I mentioned the Calgary floods of 2013 because they really took the city of Calgary by surprise. Um, the frequency of the event was not particularly severe, 30 to 50 years, and yet the center of a major city was inundated with um, a lot of, only a few deaths, but a lot of damage. Um, there's an interesting story around pollution and pollution management. So this is a rather complicated slide. And on the left, we've got the pristine waters leaving the Rocky Mountains. And here we've got the tributaries that feed from the mountains down towards the city of Saskatoon, where I was based. And the blue is phosphorus concentrations, which you can see are radically increasing, particularly in the Red Deer River as you move downstream. And the red line is what was considered to be a guideline for good water quality by the province of Alberta, 0 0.05 milligrams per litre. And you can see that that guideline is hugely um, uh, uh, exceeded, particularly as you move down through the river system. So that's a governance challenge. There's an interesting, uh, the, 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 the river basin, the Saskatchewan River Basin um, is managed by an accord between the three provinces which shares the water. So Alberta is entitled to 50% of the natural flow. Saskatchewan um, can use 50% of the natural flow that it receives, and then the rest is passed to Manitoba. But they've had a lot of difficulty in agreeing about water quality standards. And in fact, uh, Alberta has made a decision that it would um, not continue to use that surface water guidelines. So rather than taking the hard decisions to try and manage water quality, 
um, they're taking uh, the easy political way out of not seeking to enforce stricter standards. So it's the real challenge of governance in these, um, in these transboundary regions. I mean, the implication for this is that there's a lot of nutrient passing into the province of Saskatchewan, but actually Saskatchewan um, is mandated to, uh, uh, with, with water quality standards at its downstream border. So it has to absorb that pollution, but not pass it on. Another issue that's uh, quite um, pervasive is that the natural environment of the prairies is one that's recent in geological times and has a lot of natural depressions. And those have progressively been drained for agricultural use. So there are major changes to the environment, increased flood risk because of this, and of course, increased possibilities for the transmission of nutrients and loss of habitat. So that's an issue of concern. Probably 80%, sometimes more, of the landscape has been drained for agricultural production. And then that's set against a really remarkable background of environmental change. So um, Western Canada has been warming quite dramatically. Um, winter minimum temperatures have increased by two to three degrees C. Further north, permafrost is thawing. Um, in the Yukon, Interestingly, there's a river that's changed direction because um, a lake that was held in place by a glacier, the glaciers retreated, the lake now flows in a different direction. In um, one of the consequences of that is that snow cover has declined. So we're seeing something like one to two months decrease um, in the annual duration of snow cover. So bearing in mind that the water resources come from snow and ice, um, that has huge implications. Here's a, a slide that shows the increased temperatures in Saskatchewan. One of the consequences is that the glaciers in the Rocky Mountains, which have been substantial, are basically in terminal decline. So we expect that they will largely be gone by the end of the century. The, of course, the glacier melt has an important role in maintaining low river flows in the summer. Um, and what we're seeing in the um, prairies is an interesting change of hydrological behavior. So this is a slide which shows three time periods. So the upper box is uh, 1975 to 1994. Um, the lower box is um, 2011 to 2014. So historically, um, there's been in a low flow year there'd be very little flow in the river but where there's a year with substantial snowfall then we get spring snow melt and that's seen in these earlier periods and in the last few years there's been quite a different pattern because now we're seeing summer storms appearing that generate summer floods that can exceed uh, the winter snow melt so it's a real shift in regime there so these are some of the issues that we face um, in the local environment in Canada. And so with our new institute, we decided that we would um, address these and try and develop the science needed to underpin management. So we took the basin as a very large outdoor laboratory. And within that, we focused on a whole number of sites, some of which are shown here. So um, Marmot Creek, is an important research site for us in the Rockies. Uh, Pato Glacier, an important site for glacier processes. In fact, my colleague John Pomeroy has something like 50 observation stations across the Rocky Mountains, and we have a base, um, a permanent uh, office and lab in the Rocky Mountains. The boreal forest is hugely important. It's about 30% of Canada. It's one of the world's major biomes and we're, we have instrumentation to understand the water and carbon dynamics there. Here we have in the prairies, several sites where we're looking at um, uh, soil moisture response and climate interactions. And a couple of features that I'll mention, Lake Diefenbaker here is an important control on the basin. It's about 200 kilometers long. When it was built, it was the largest earth dam in the world. 
So that's an important regulator for the river downstream. And here is the delta, um, which, um, as I mentioned earlier, is the home to indigenous people, the Métis and the Cree. So here are some of our sites in the Rocky Mountains, uh, Marmot Creek, um, in, the um, in the prairies. Um, there's a very long standing set of experimental sites called Burns, um, it, it, sorry, in the Boreal Forest. In the prairies, we have several sites, including Smith Creek. And this is Lake Diefenbaker, that very large lake, which has started to have significant problems of algal brooms. And one of the reasons for this is because we've had this large load of phosphorus coming down the river from Alberta. And a lot of the phosphorus is retained in the lake sediments and we're concerned about its re-emergence. So those are some of the challenges. What do we do about it? Well, one of the things we need to do is to look to the meteorology and meteorological models. We have a major problem in Canada of a lack of um, observations of precipitation and other meteorological variables. It's a large country, big areas, few people, data are very sparse. Um, so we, there's an important role in using meteorological models to help us understand current climate inputs and future on climate inputs. When I arrived in Canada, the quality of meteorological modeling um, was not good. Um, estimates of seasonal precipitation could be out by 90%. So one of the things that we've done is to move to high resolution atmospheric modeling in conjunction with NCAR in the USA. So we now model the whole of Western Canada on a four kilometer grid that allows us to do a much better job at resolving precipitation. Um, I'm sorry I can't show you the animations on this, but um, uh, we have with uh, significant work with um, drones, which now allow us to get a much better uh, measurements and insights into the dynamics of snow in our, um, in our Rocky Mountain headwaters. An interesting new development that we're um, doing some preliminary work on is the SWAT mission, which is uh, about to launch a satellite um, to measure water levels from space. It's a very exciting initiative. We'll be able to observe lakes and large rivers and measure them from space. And we've been involved in some aerial programs to test those initiatives. Some of the data we get from our sites give us important insights. This is what a frozen soil looks like in the prairies. So we've got precipitation on the top and snow melt uh, and snowpack building up and melting, building up and melting. And here's the temperature profile showing freezing reaching down into the profile and then thawing. Um, and one of the challenges to, is to develop improved models to simulate those complex systems. Another thing that we've been doing is looking at frozen lakes. So people tend to measure lakes in the summer when they're ice free. There's been very little understanding of the chemistry of those lakes under frozen conditions. So we've been doing important work in that area. Um, it's important because records are short to try and learn from the past. So we've also been looking at tree rings to help us reconstruct the flows in some of the tributaries of our river system. In this case, we now have uh, records going back to 1600. And they're interesting because they show that while we've had major drought periods in the 30s, if we look back in the, over that period, then uh, certainly there were very prolonged drought periods in the historical record. And if people are skeptical about climate change, and some are, even though it's all around them, then it's very helpful to be able to point back to these long records and say, well, you don't need to believe in climate change, just look at the past and see what's happened. And drought remains a major threat to water resources. We've been able to use our observations to check um, climate models. And this is an interesting slide because it shows that if our, when we look at our observations, we see certain patterns linking temperature and humidity and wind speed and so on. 
but when we see our model simulations, those are not well reproduced. So we have the ability with these detailed sites to interrogate and improve our models. We've done a lot of work to improve land surface modeling. The prairies has been a very difficult area to model and we've improved that. Um, more generally, we've been using satellite data to improve our modeling capabilities. So as some of you will know about the GRACE satellite, which is a, a pair of satellites that together measure changes in the Earth's magnetic field. And those can be related to changes in water storage. That's um, been widely used to show over extraction of groundwater in India, for example. Well, we've used these data to help us improve our, our model, our modeling of these large scale areas. Um, and if we improve that, we can improve our model performance. And also, this is a slide that shows model parameters and the associated uncertainty in those model parameters. And if we use um, the combination of observed stream flow and this GRACE data set, we can reduce the uncertainty in our parameters and hence have more confidence when we apply them to ungaged areas. Uh, another area of need for large scale modeling is to improve our representation of water management. And very often at large scale, we don't know how dams and reservoirs are operated. Um, so we've got improved tools to um, take observed data that we have and use those to develop um, a simulation of how those dams are being operated. I want to make a point and I mentioned it earlier that water is not just a natural system, it's a human natural system. And I'll just show you this picture, which shows the flow series at, at uh, Saskatoon before and after the construction of that Diefenbaker Dam. So the natural flow regime has a summer peak, very convenient for irrigation water. But after that large storage, then that peak is really inverted. Um, so we've lost the natural variability and that has important implications for those wetlands at the base of the, um, of the river system. We've done work to look at the vulnerability of the water resources. And this is um, an example where we can look at potential changes to the flows from the Rocky Mountains, changing the annual volume, changing the time of the peak, because we expect earlier snow melt and earlier peaks and lower peaks. And um, this shows how operating the water resource system um, maps in terms of a warning, a set of warning colors. So if we're in the blue, um, then we're safe with our current operating policies. If we move into the red, then we can't meet our existing demands. And uh, we have to think about um, how we manage the water resources into the future, perhaps with additional storage or perhaps reduced irrigation supplies. We can do more on that. Um, so we can look, for example, at different scenarios and how that affects hydropower generation. Um, I have an animation which I think won't work in this mode, but we've also developed tools where we can play games with the system with users and we can increase irrigation downstream and see how it affects the flows and the storages and, um, and how that affects the requirement to pass water on downstream. There's a new area of hydrology that's been developing recently called sociohydrology, which really tries to recognize the importance of people. And that's partly because we're thinking about water as a managed system, and also partly because we really need to communicate with people to understand their perspectives and help them manage risks. So we've done social science experiments with people. We've done a lot of work with communities, including developing First Nations communities in terms of self-help monitoring. They're very concerned about the quality of their waters and their fish, which they eat. We've also done a lot of work with the arts, including art exhibitions and also a play called Downstream. So we've had a lot of fun. We've brought together many disciplines 
from drama to computer science to uh, civil engineering to geology, geography, biological sciences, the social sciences, public policy. And we've created a critical mass that's really done quite a lot of work to better understand the challenges and provide improved modeling tools to planners and improved understanding to the local population. Um, I'll just say a few words about how we've moved on from that initial program. So I went to Canada in 1910, 2010, and um, we brought together the community within the university and Environment and Climate Change Canada working together. And that's the work I've just described. But in 2013, we thought a little bit bigger and we brought together a Changing Coal Regions Network of eight universities and four federal agencies and 43 co-investigators. And that allowed us to change our scope from the Saskatchewan River Basin to include the Mackenzie, which is another million square kilometers and the largest freshwater flow into the Arctic Ocean from North America, experiencing a rapid change due to permafrost thaw and, uh, and other changes in the system. So we really followed the same strategy of um, working with observatories, trying to improve our understanding of the changes and our ability to model. And I think an important point about this network is that we connected a lot more with the ecologists to understand the threats to forest ecosystems and, and um, subarctic tundra in, in an era of, of global warming. So one of the um, outputs from that program has been a better understanding of what scenarios of change we might see in the future. This simply shows how mixed wood forest um, might evolve as we move through to the later part of the 21st century. And an important part of this story is um, the resilience of these forests to fire and other disturbances and how changing patterns of tree um, species will emerge um, uh, as, as the existing species lose their resilience. And we're converting that into estimates of uh, what future flows might look like in our river systems, the Saskatchewan River, uh, into the future to uh, mid-century and late century, and also the Mackenzie Basin as we move forward over the same periods. So that's been a program which um, uh, finished a, a year or two ago, and we're just producing um, the results of that in some papers which are currently either in press or in review, um, summarizing the results of that program. My original funding was for seven years, and when seven years was approaching, we thought, how do we continue? And then a remarkable opportunity arose because the government of Canada put up one and a half billion dollars for the universities to bid for to address um, issues that were of societal importance. And um, we at the University of Saskatchewan were successful in winning um, a grant uh, of about $80 million, but also with our partners, we pulled together another $140 million of initial program support. It was built around the four universities, Saskatchewan, Waterloo, McMaster, Laurier, and um, many others. So we were really able to bring together the academic community in Canada to focus on this theme of water and water futures and how to meet the challenges of, of, of global change. Once again, we had our observatories now spread over the whole of Canada. And once again, we had a program of um, pan-Canadian modeling and data assimilation so we could do a better job at predicting the future. And um, Bearing in mind that uh, a lot of Canada is cold um, and much of the world gets its resources from coal regions, um, this program has also sought to reach out to look at some of the world's mountain ranges and how those will be changing. 
um, including collaboration with India. That is ongoing. Um, and um, this is a slide that you'll find it difficult to read at this scale, but uh, there are nearly a thousand researchers involved, 800 publications so far, um, a couple of thousand presentations, 3,000 stories in the media, and so on and so forth. Um, a couple of notable features. The program has really done a lot of work to work with indigenous communities, which has been a very difficult and challenging area, but a very rewarding area. And we've been very concerned about the lack of appropriate governance in Canada. I mentioned that Canada has provinces which are really independent in terms of water management. There is a, at present, for example, no national flood forecasting system. So we, and in particular, my colleague, John Pomeroy, who now runs this program, which I started, um, has been doing a terrific job working with the Canadian government. And they are now planning a new Canadian water agency, really stimulated by the work of this program and the pressure that um, uh, has been brought together to, 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 to move forward. So just to conclude this section, um, these are really times, as I started by saying, of unprecedented water challenges. Half the world is at risk to water security. To move forward, we need to do new disciplinary science to understand the changing environment. We also need to do a much better job of pulling together the sciences. For example, when we want to look at water futures over Northern Canada, we really have to have intensive discussions with biologists and ecologists about issues like the future resilience of these forest communities. We need to do a much better job at linking science to society, uh, understanding people's attitudes and perceptions and communicating the nature of the challenges to them. We need investment in research infrastructure there's really a huge need to monitor in detail uh, in the field to understand changes. And then we need national and international investment to allow these research communities to function in an integrated way. And just to close, I'm really excited at some of the developments that have been taking place in links between India and Imperial College. So there've been a couple of projects, one Hydroflux run from 2012 to 2016. NERC is the UK's Natural Environment Research Council. And Walter Butart and Prajit Majumra, who's on this call, um, have been working to investigate interactions between changes to the land and changes to the climate. And that's um, been continued in another project, which, is, um, which ran um, 2016 to 2018. And they're really interesting results showing that um, uh, irrigation activities over the Gangetic Plains do feed back to climate and local meteorology. So we really are working with a large scale system with large scale feedbacks that we need to better understand. And they've also been working to improve socio-hydrological modeling, building communities, links to communities of farmers and irrigators, for example, to understand their concerns and their dynamics and help them um, plan their water management. So some of the big challenges that I've spoken about are being addressed at IISC Bangalore. I'm very happy to see that. So there is Professor Govind Rao looking at us in a rather um, determined way, I think. Um, as I started off by saying, he's a man who really bridged the gaps between science and engineering and the challenges of society. And it's really up to us to follow in his footsteps and follow his example and help India to meet its challenges in the same way. So thank you very much for your attention. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you. I hope you followed my slides despite the fact that uh, I haven't managed to get the technology to work quite well. But um, anyway, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Professor Vita. Um, I think Dr. Raghuveer will now uh, moderate uh, the Q and A session. Yeah. Any questions, please, from the audience? Maybe they can use the hand symbol as well if you want to unmute them. Okay. In the meantime, I have one question, Professor. Uh, so generally, we expect the state to do these type of activities of water security and all. What is the role of individuals and society? Yes, I think that's a, an interesting question. Um, when I went to Canada, um, I was surprised um, by the fact that um, communities there are small and government is relatively close to hand. So um, if you're working as a researcher in a province, you will have very strong links to your provincial water agency and you'll be able to talk to ministers and so on. So I think that's an environment where um, it, individual researchers and universities, particularly if they bring together critical mass, as, as I've shown that we did, can really have a very direct influence on policy. Um, I think in the UK, um, it's things, things are a little bit more distant, but I've been involved in several programs. Um, for example, programs advising the government on the research needed to improve the, their ability to manage flood risk. Um, and I've also been able to pull together national programs to identify the science needs around certain challenges. For example, we had a major program to look at nutrients, uh, the problem of nutrients in groundwater and how that could be managed. So I think there is a real opportunity for academics to come together um, to, to, to propose the kind of programs that are needed of research to meet societal challenges, and then to plug away, pushing those results to, to government through the available channels um, so I'm, I'm optimistic that there are ways through this, but I think that um, when I started off as a young researcher, you know, I was sitting at my desk and I thought, well, I needed to produce some papers and people would read them and that would be fine. You know, that era is, is not real. Um, we, we have to, when we do our work, promote it and explain to people why it's useful and how it can help them and be much more proactive. And a lot of the work we've been doing in Canada, we've sought to engage the relevant stakeholders. So when we've developed models, we need to talk to them about what they need in a model, how they see model validity, and how they can use the results. So we have to be much more outward facing uh, in the current, to meet the current challenges. Yeah, Professor Anbelgan, please. Professor Anbalgan, you can ask your question. Yeah, uh, now I'm audible. Yes. Hello? Yes. Hello. I'm audible? Yes, yes, you can continue. Yeah, so uh, good morning, Professor Ardwar Viter. So nowadays the urbans are consuming more the natural uh, water. Uh, so the share of going to irrigations are keep decreasing due to urbanization. So there is any uh, way which can be controlled or uh, maximized uh, towards the agriculture activities, reduce the waters in urbans? That's a, an interesting question. Um, I've just last week flown from Arizona and the city of Phoenix. And um, Phoenix is in a desert and it's expanded its urban um, area dramatically um, at the expense of water that was previously used for um, agricultural irrigation. Um, and interestingly, you can drive through central Phoenix and you can see quite large areas still under cultivation. And that's where the water rights are owned by um, uh, in, indigenous people. 
uh, and they um, they have not sold those rights to the development. So it's um, it's a global trend um, that um, uh, water follows money and um, agricultural um, use of water can be bought out by for urban development. Um, well, there are two ways to manage the future. One, one interesting aspect of Phoenix is that, um, and the US in general, is that uh, domestic water use, per capita water use, <coughs> has actually been declining quite significantly. And that's partly because of new standards um, for improved efficiency. Um, the problem in, in, in Phoenix is, is really outdoor use. So where people have irrigated lawns and pools, that's a big consumer of water. So the, the internal water use is declining. Um, outdoor water use is, um, is not. Um, irrigation is a, real, is a real challenge about the social license for irrigation. It's the world's biggest consumer of water, 80 to 85% of water consumption globally is for irrigation. I didn't say, but um, the same statistic applies in the Saskatchewan River Basin, about 80 to 85% of the consumed water is for irrigation. So we just have to be more efficient in our irrigation, um, move, move to less intensive um, production mechanisms. Um, and uh, on the other hand, um, the agricultural sector and its large water use does provide some resilience to maintain supplies in drought years. So although agriculture might have to be sacrificed in a drought year, um, uh, uh, urban uses can continue with that buffer there. But it's a, it's a challenge and it's a challenge that um, is, is not being met well around the world um, uh, because we see overuse of water for, um, for irrigation um, in many parts of the world and that really is unsustainable. Yeah, uh, there is a question. Thank from, you. There is a question from Sunil Kumar, Director, Central Water Commission, New Delhi. Modeling software has been used for allocation of water resources between Canada and USA, which is one of the very few such instances worldwide. What is your opinion on using such scientific tools for water allocation between states? Ebo is the in reference to Saskatchewan basin only. Yes, the um, US-Canada um, international relationship is an interesting one. Um, there's an international border uh, boundary commission, boundary waters commission, which has independent members that jointly manage those waters. Um, and they have um, a program of collaboration between the two countries, which in general has been very effective. Um, it stumbled a little bit in the Trump era, but in general, it's been effective. So Canadians inspect um, and, and approve uh, American data and, and vice versa. And I think the modeling that's been done um, has been on the basis of models that are approved by both sides. So um, I think it's important to develop modeling tools that can be open and can be inspected and that both sides can critique. And if you can build consensus around the validity of models, then they can be really very powerful tools. Um, where you don't have that consensus, um, you can get into a very difficult situation where somebody's saying, well, my, my model's right and your model's wrong. And that's something that really needs to be avoided. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in these conflict situations to build confidence around tools that both sides can agree on. And I certainly have been involved in cases where that has not occurred and there's been very strong disagreement and indeed misuse of models, mm -hmm. inappropriate use of models to give inappropriate results. So it's a very interesting question. And um, uh, I think that models are a great unifier if they used in an open and transparent manner. Thank you. Professor Jayant Kumar. Uh, very nice presentation, Professor Veter. Uh, in our country, we are depending a lot on the domestic water, especially in the urban city. And we are depending more on the groundwater. Huh? And very often, the groundwater table is going down and we are putting emphasis on recharging the ground by 
means of some kind of bore well or some kind of artificial bore. So this is a kind of policy in our country, invariably in all the big cities in our country. Is the same trend is continuing everywhere else in the world, especially in the big cities in England, in Canada, USA? Is the policy similar or uh, this is somewhat uh, different in different parts of the world? Thank Regarding you. the rainwater harvesting I'm talking about. Yes, um, that's an interesting question. I talked in my Canada talk very little about groundwater um, because on the whole, um, the deep aquifers there are quite saline um, and they're um, not very much used to water supply. Although there's an interesting story that the city of Regina, um, uh, which is at the south of the province of Saskatchewan down towards the United States border, that city was founded because they were pushing the railroad through and they finally, they, they accidentally discovered a potable aquifer. And so they, um, they then uh, built a city around there. Um, in the UK, um, groundwater is, is huge. Um, it maintains London's water supply. And um, there have been a, a lot of issues um, of um, groundwater over extraction. And actually, there's a very interesting story. I'm not sure if you know about that, but the, the fountains in London's Trafalgar Square used to be artesian. And then <laughs> in the Industrial Revolution, the water tables were heavily drawn down. Um, <laughs> But then more recently, they've started to rise up again. So actually, they have to pump water out to keep the subway. Is there any kind of norms by the government that you need to recharge the ground if you are extracting the water more than by a certain volume per unit time? Yeah, so, so there, there certainly are places um, in the east of England where uh, there's active recharge to improve the efficiency. And I know, I mean, I, I'm not sure of the, the, the current state, but I know that uh, there was a lot of concerns about um, uh, water quality and the need to treat and to prevent well clogging and so on. Um, and similarly, going back to Arizona, um, then the water supply to Phoenix is partly from the Colorado River, partly from local reservoirs and partly from groundwater. And that groundwater has been overdrawn. And so they are again, actively recharging. So I think there's a lot of interest worldwide in active management of aquifers, and it's a very promising tool as long as one can maintain um, appropriate water quality conditions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, anyone else? I'm not seeing any more hands raised. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, please, can, please go ahead. Uh, my name is Ravichandra. Uh, I am from ACRWRM Bangalore. Uh, I have one question regarding uh, in the Indian context, uh, there is a lot of discussions going on interlinking of rivers, uh, that is from perennial to seasonal rivers. So in a long run, uh, do you think this is going to be sustainable? And uh, next question is, uh, is it like, uh, in everywhere in the world, this sort of idea has been successfully implemented. So can you please uh, answer the questions? Thank you. Sorry, I, I, I didn't quite catch the first part of the question. Could you just repeat it's, uh, it? It's interlinking of rivers. So interlinking Sorry? of rivers, like uh, per, we have perennial rivers uh, which are flowing in the northern part of the India. And there are some seasonal rivers in the southern part of the India. So there has been a lot of discussions to interlink them. So, ah, water linkage. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what is your opinion yeah, on that? Yeah. Like, is it sustainable in long run? Um, the, there's been a lot of discussion over many decades in the UK about moving water from the west to the east, and a major concern has been to do with water, the different water qualities and the associated impacts on aquatic ecosystems, and that's really been the reason why no, the, none of those developments um, has taken place. Um, certainly, um, there have been a lot of ambitious proposals for moving water around, and, and China is an obvious example where there's been massive movement of water um, to, the, to the dry north. But um, uh, I have had conversations with the previous environment minister of China about this, and 
he was really very much against that, um, saying really it was, was better to make more sustainable use of the local water resources, not least because it's very expensive to move water around. And once you import water to an area, then you've got to, to treat the, um, the discharges too. So I, I think there are lots of challenges in large scale water movement and um, it's, it's a, more attractive often to think about um, more efficient management of local water resources. But clearly there are regions of the world which are under severe pressure. Um, for example, the city of Riyadh in Saudi Arabia um, is only really able to exist because of large scale importation of desalinated water from, uh, from the sea uh, over many thousands of kilometers. So um, uh, it's a complicated story. I don't think there's a simple answer. Thank you. Professor Abdul. Uh, hi, Professor Vita. Uh, my name is Abdul Penjari. I'm a faculty in transportation um, uh, uh, group in the civil engineering department at IAC. Thank you for the very engaging uh, talk. Um, I, I have a question about, um, um, in your experience, uh, what helps and what sort of motivates um, faculty and students uh, in academic institutions where the primary metric of evaluation is um, um, the scientific outcomes, uh, such as publications and so on. Um, um, what motivates uh, people to work on socially relevant problems where one has to go beyond published, which you also were uh, you know, alluding to uh, earlier in your talk, where one has to go beyond publishing and connect with governments, industry, and, and, and stakeholders across the board, even if it needs, needs connecting with uh, the citizens and so on. Um, so, in your experience, well, what what helps one uh, you know go beyond that, and and what can universities do to to sort of make people go beyond the typical uh, traditional scientific outcomes? Thank you. That's a very interesting question. Um, well, I think um, there's a, a on on the one hand, there's a lot of need these days to um, to pursue research that's relevant to societal needs and to convince society that work of research is, is relevant to their needs. Um, I think to, to make an argument for research funding, um, then it's really important to be able to argue that one is addressing important societal issues, otherwise the funding is not going to be sustainable. Um, so there are some motivations, financial motivations, um, that if you want to pursue substantive research, you need to persuade society that it should be funded. Um, the, the second part of the question concerns the fact that really as soon as you start working with stakeholders, it becomes um, a huge um, consumer of personal time. And, and that's a real challenge. Um, I think um, in, in Canada, um, I had a, a few colleagues who were really very devoted to working, for example, with First Nations communities. And they spent a lot of time um, developing relationships which require persistent contacts over years and decades. Um, and the output in terms of publications is not great from that. So I think there has to be um, a recognition in terms of uh, career assessment that um, engagement with stakeholders is important for the social enterprise and the scientific enterprise, and it has to be valued um, a a alongside the traditional publication routes. And, and that's a, a, a difficult path to follow. Uh, so you're, you're right to highlight that as an area of some concern. Um, more generally, um, when I came to Canada, I really brought people together across disciplines for the first time, and I had some money, <laughs> not a lot of money, but that was a very useful way of persuading people to engage in conversations. And once they started interacting, then I think they discovered some very fruitful and productive relationships that could be developed by taking multiple disciplines and working on the same problem. So a little bit of money 
um, stimulated that initial interaction. But then as people got to know each other, then they perceived the benefits that were there long term for working across disciplines. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Any more questions? I'm not seeing any raised hands. So may I request Professor Vivi Srinivas to propose a vote of thanks. Professor Srinivas. Professor Srinivas. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm uh, muted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, good evening to you all. Uh, on behalf of Department of Civil Engineering, it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. First, I thank our distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Professor Howard Weter, for uh, sparing his uh, invaluable time to grace this occasion and enlightening us with. Uh, his uh, thought-provoking uh, splendid speech, which touched upon uh, various issues related to uh, the global water challenges and uh, uh, the way forward with examples from Canada and India. And I would like to express my sincere thanks to Professor Goindan Rangarajan, Director, Indian Institute of Science, for presiding uh, on this uh, occasion. Uh, and I thank uh, Professor Anant Ramaswamy, Chairman, Department of Civil Engineering, and various uh, or several colleagues and uh, the staff members uh, and volunteers who have come forward for extending their support for organizing this particular event. I thank family members of uh, Professor N. S. Goindrao uh, for attending this lecture. And last but not the least, I thank all the audience for attending this event and making it a grand success. Thank you, one and all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Beter. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you all for listening to me. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Professor Beter. It was insightful. Thank you very much. Thank you and goodbye to all. Okay, so now we can close it. Yes. Mm -hmm.